So if you have not been with us and you are visiting today, we are going through 1 John and we have covered a lot up to this point in time. And as our brother read starting in verse 4, we come to this term again, beloved. We know by now that John is using a term that he heard Jesus himself speak. He is referring to the children of God with great affection. And then he says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit. Test the spirits. In our day and age, we do not have many people testing the spirits anymore. In fact, if you want a good exercise, walk into any Christian bookstore and you will be given a great test if you actually read the authors, who they are, where they come from, what church they are part of, and you will realize quickly that not everything that says it's Christian is actually Christian. And the reason why we don't like doing things like this is because many of us do not like tests. We do not like to be put into a test or an examination. For many, it's a terrible experience because we relate a test or an examination with that of school or maybe something practical. You read a textbook, you get academic knowledge, and therefore an instructor will ask you to take that knowledge, draw it out of your mind, put it on a piece of paper to see if you are truly learning. Maybe if you're an apprentice in the room, you've had a test to see if you actually know about pipe fitting or carpentry or mechanics, and you take a test to show practical knowledge has been gained so that you're able to function. And we also know that there's tests within our Christian walk. Many times in Christianity, we are brought to a certain trial in life. We are brought to a certain crossroads, and in that time, we have to make a decision. It's going to be a purpose of our sanctification. Are we going to go left or right? Are we going to continue to move forward in our discipline and in our profession of faith? But John uses this word, doesn't he? In 1 John 4, verse 1, he uses this term, testing. And testing is a very interesting word because from the Greek, it's dokimazo. And so, again, there's different tenses for this word, but what it basically means is that an individual is making an observation. There is an undertaking taking place. You are inspecting very carefully something one way or another. In fact, the Apostle Paul uses this exact term in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. When we are taking communion, we are to examine. We are to inspect. We are to be very careful on how we are observing ourselves at that moment. But it's not just used by the Apostle Paul in Corinthians. It's also found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. And there it says, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing to men, but God who examines the heart. And in this day and age, it would do many pastors and many seminary professors well to look at this verse and remember that it is God who examines our heart and they are not and we are not called to please men. But Paul goes a little bit further in that letter in chapter 5, verse 21. Examine everything carefully. Take a careful examination, an inspection, an observation. Just because a pastor may wear a tie and come up to a place like this and preach something, you have a responsibility to go home and to dissect everything you heard and weigh it in accordance to Holy Scripture. And men, you who are men of your home, have a responsibility to ensure what your wives and your children are taking in and what you are taking in is being examined very carefully and holding fast to which what is good. And so right out of the gate, we can start seeing very clearly in 1 John 4, 1, though it's a beautiful statement, the Christian life is not a bunch of people on blown up rubber tubes going down the river of easy Christianity. Christianity is an examination, it's inspection each and every day, and in a culture in which we live in now in Canada, when the government is suppressing information, when they're attacking the Christian faith, when they're coming at every single point of what we believe and hold to, such as LGBTQ issues, such as public education, who has rights in their home, churches being shut down, we cannot simply sit back and say, well, if the government's okay with us, we must 
must be doing something right. No, 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 we don't float down the river. We paddle upstream. We get hit by the rocks. We get, we get beaten down. We get tired because our arms are consistently going. And that's what Christians are called to do. When our day has come and our eyes close and we go before the Lord, we get to have some rest then, but we don't get to sit back today and think it's going to be easy breezy, some kind of easy believism of Christianity. So we go back again to verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So there's more familiar language again here, but there is a very strong caution by the apostle. And this strong caution is deserving of an underline in your Bible and to be echoing in your mind every single time you turn on Daystar, TBN, or any other network that has a bunch of charlatans trying to give you something that is false, and that is do not believe. Do not believe every spirit. Now this is a ma massive charge. What he's telling us is that we are not called as Christians to give credence to every single voice that we hear claiming to be Christian. And there are many, many movements, many churches, many men who can wear a suit and tie and speak from the Bible who are not sound in the faith. Just because it might be looking like Christianity doesn't mean it is. In fact, in today's day, I would go as far as this. It may look like a duck, it may sound like a duck, but it's a decoy. And if you know anything about hunting, the decoys are there to get you to land and think it is safe, and then you're killed. And that is exactly what the enemy wants to do. Make you think it's safe, make you think it's peaceful, and before you know it, you are entangled in all kinds of nonsense. So let's talk a little bit of some extreme for a moment. Let's go back to the 1700s by the name of Anne Lee. Anne Lee was a shaker. Anne Lee claimed that she had the personifications of Jesus Christ. She claimed that she was a female Jesus. And people not equipped to handle the word of God believed her and were led astray by her teaching. A false prophet, a false teacher. The universal church of the Gnostic movement by Sam Unwar. Another false prophet who claimed that not only that he would die, but in 1978 he would have a resurrection like that of Jesus Christ. Where is he today? Then you have Yahweh bin Yahweh, a black national separatist who not only claimed that he was God, but he was also a murderer. All claiming to be some type of Christ or Christian movement. These are some good examples of what can go wrong? But what if it doesn't go that far? Well, you have men like David Koresh. And in 1993, out of Waco, Texas, he and his followers went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the DEA and the FBI, and people died, and Koresh claimed that he was Christ. For some of you who are older in this room, you know about George uh, Jonestown. And you know how this Jim Jones took people and claimed to that he was a prophet, that he was like Christ. They took him to an encampment. And then near the end, they would they drink the Kool-Aid. Anybody here ever use that term? Oh, don't drink that Kool-Aid. That's where it originates from. Believers were basically to drink the Kool-Aid and they would die. If they refused to drink it, it was injected into them. If they refused the injection, they were shot. All claiming to be Christ. Now these are the very most extreme examples when things can go wrong. This is like the far left side of the pendulum as it were. But it all started by mishandling the word of God. One drop, one mishandle, one lack of accountability, one lack of being disciplined in Holy Scripture and everything went wayward. And that is why we are to be people, to be people of the word. Not simply what we feel, not what we experience, not what tickles us in our emotions and makes us happy, but by the very word of God. 
And that's what Paul's getting at in 2 Timothy 2.15. He tells us clearly that we are to present ourselves approved. We are to present ourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, who rightly handles the word of truth. It's not enough to read my daily bread and take your life verse and pin it on the fridge and change it to whatever you want. It's not enough just to read a morning and evening devotion with Charles Spurgeon and just get a few little tidbits of what happens. Trust me, Spurgeon's good. I'd rather you read that than, you know, my daily bread. But no, the word of God is what you are to be studying and examining and holding on to. And what happens then when you ignore scripture? David Koresh. Jim Jones, and others. What happens when you claim that scripture is not enough? Do we not have that now? Things are going on in the world. People want a move from God. We have people coming out of Asbury right now, out of Wilmore, Kentucky, saying, God told me that I'm to go to this revival. Then God told me, look to your left. God told me to look to your right. So he believed what he thought he heard was from God, but when we hear these things, it means that scripture's not enough. We have men and women going from place to place, from movement to movement. We have all these charismatic churches that are sitting there saying, I'm so dry, I need to be recharged, I need, I need to be jacked up by the Holy Spirit with the cables of the, of the Spirit because they are not satisfied in the very revelation that God has given us in order for us to know how we are to be saved and how we are to live Holy Scripture. You know who else was like that? Charles Russell Taze. Charles Russell Taze was an American restorationist minister out of Pittsburgh. Do you know what he started? Zion's Watchtower and Track Society. And you all know this as the people who knock on your door on Saturday mornings, the Jehovah's Witness. At a young age, around 16, he wasn't satisfied with the teachings of the church. He couldn't get his mind around hell and other things, and so him and his buddy decided to just, you know, to skip ahead for this morning's message, to start a new movement. You know what their Bible is? The New World Translation. The most corrupted thing that you would want to own. They have no accountability. They don't tell you who their Greek scholars are. They deny the Trinity. What about Joseph Smith, Jr.? Joseph Smith Jr. also denied Holy Scripture. He claimed that God and the Son visited him on one visitation and that the entire Christian church was completely polluted. On another visitation, he claimed that the Mor- Moroni visited him with the golden tablets and that's why you have the Book of Mormon and now you have the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints. And many pastors don't have the gun, the, 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 oh, thank you, Lord, have the nerve to call these men out. In fact, back in, I think it was 2008 or 2009, during the U.S. election, the Billy Graham Evangelical Society even removed Mormonism from their website because one of the candidates was Mormon. And now you have pastors telling you that we all serve the same Jesus. It's the same God. But your holy scriptures that have been given to us, your very Bibles tell us otherwise. And we talked about this when Pastor Tony was going through 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard, Antichrist is coming even now. Many Antichrists have appeared, and this is how you know it is the last hour. And so we can tell that we know from, from Christ's ascension, from Pentecost, that was the beginning of the last hour. But even in our day and age today, we have many antichrists. Make it very clear in your hearts and your minds this morning, if you are not for Christ, you are against Christ. If you are against Christ, it is antichrist. It's as simple as that. And that is why we have this test. So let's just do one more test. For those who may be Roman Catholic, buckle up. Because the Roman Catholic Church is one of the biggest antichrist movements that we have. The antichrist is indeed a great whore in the eyes of God. 
She is the one who claims to have authority and to claim what only Christ is allowed to have. She is the true example of the Antichrist. She claims to give the teachings of Jesus Christ and God, but they are wrong. And they are so arrogant and they are blasphemous as they oppose our holy, holy, holy God. How so, Pastor Steve? They deny justification by faith alone. Oh yes, they hold on to justification by faith, but not alone. They deny sola gratia, grace alone. They hold on to their works. They have something to add to their salvation. So much so, Charles Spurgeon says, quote, Any church which puts in place of justification by faith in Christ, another method of salvation is a harlot church. So if you're still tripped up on me for saying one word, you got some problems with Spurgeon himself. Further, the mass. If you didn't come to men's breakfast yesterday, you missed out. Tony, man, he was just dropping bombs. And the mass is a repeat of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Every single Sunday when the mass happens, they are re-sacrificing Jesus Christ. They take their eyes off Christ. You know what's even worse? They put their eyes on Mary. Mary. They act like she's co-redemptrix. They claim that she's had a miraculous, what's that word I'm looking for? Thank you, conception. But she didn't. And then you have this arrogant pope the Pope. And since you weren't here yesterday, most men, you don't get the wonderful lesson, but I'll just say, Pope Pius IX, through extra cathedra, made the Immaculate Conception of Mary church dogma. You know who else did that? Pope John Paul II. Pope John Paul II reintroduced this great devotion to Mary. And there's a big problem with this because they treat Mary as if she's part of the monarchy, that she's co-redemptrix, that they pray to her, they intercede with her, they ask her to mediate on their behalf. But 1 Timothy 2.5 tells us, for there is one God and one mediator, and between God and man, that is Jesus Christ alone. So for the sake of time, this bishop of Rome What else do they call him? Anybody know? Holy Father. The Bishop of Rome is called the Holy Father. And Matthew 23, verse 9 says, Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. That's why Luther wrote, quote, We are, excuse me, we here are of the conviction that the papacy is the seat of the true and real Antichrist, against whose deceit and vileness all is permitted for the salvation of souls. Personally, I declare that I owe no pope, no other obedience than that to the Antichrist. End quote. John Haas, before Martin Luther, sparked the Reformation, he was also an early reformer, says, quote, neither is the Pope the head nor are the cardinals the whole body of the holy universal Catholic, i.e. true church. For Christ alone is the head of the church. And we know this. Dear brother, you read it during the music ministry. Colossians 1, 15 through 18. Again, as a reminder, this is what we deem the supremacy of Christ verses. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. This is why the Roman Catholic Church is disgusting. And that snake Francis, who holds and calls himself the vicar of Christ, the one who put a video out in 2017 and says all religions worship the same God and we're all God's children. Spurgeon also says, quote, 
Christ did not redeem his church with his blood so the Pope could come in and steal away the glory. He never came from heaven to earth and poured out his very heart that he might purchase his people so that a poor sinner, a mere man, should be set upon high to be admired by all the nations and to call himself God's representative on earth. Christ has always been the head of his church, end quote. So praise God. So you see, not every spirit is from God. Not everything that claims to be Christian is Christian. Not everything that can say words such as baptize, Holy Spirit, come together, fellowship, Bible, it does not mean it is true, authentic Christianity. And the verse tells us very clearly how we know that. And it says again, many false prophets have gone out into the world, just like there are today. That word for false is used 11 times within your scripture, and it means to deliberately deceive. It's not just fake. It's not like a young man who's going through seminary, and he has to preach his first sermon, and he mishandles a couple texts. Maybe he missed the main point of the text. That's not false teaching. False teaching is when you have men to say what you're teaching is wrong. Here's the, S, here's the reasons why it's wrong. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And here's historic Christianity telling you that you're wrong. And you look and go, I don't care. It makes a good point. Sells. I get more ties when I preach that way. That's false teaching. But that's what it means, somebody who pur- purposely deceives. Somebody pretending to be a prophet. Do we not hear that today? How many times do we have to hear that the president is the antichrist and that he's going to be the one who sets off thermal global nuclear war and they prophesy about the end and it never comes to pass. And people look at the Christian church like we're a bunch of weirdos. Another same usage is found in Matthew 7.15. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. How do false prophets, false teachers, find their way into the church? Through uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. But do you know what's worse than that? Because many people don't hear the gospel anymore. Those sheep grow up to become pastors. And then you have pastors in sheep's clothing. Worse, you have wolves in shepherd's clothing. False teachers, false prophets coming into the world. Matthew 24, 11. Many false prophets will rise and lead many astray. May I ask this question this morning? Who's on your bookshelf? Who is on your bookshelf? Who do you read more? Scripture first, but who do you read more? Is it Beth Moore? Is it Joyce Meyer? Is it Benny Hinn? You have to ask these questions because if that is what you're reading, that is what you believe. This is what you're taking in unless you're doing it on an academic level to refute the teachings that are going on with their writings. But this is what's been happening with Christianity. In the 1990s, Todd, uh, excuse me, John Arnett, leader of the Toronto Blessing Movement, claimed with other false teachers that there's going to be great rivers of the three rivers coming together. And they had men and women bouncing around, barking like dogs, rolling all over the place. It was horrible. Flags were waving. People were getting poked in the eye. It was just a mess. But who came out of that? One of the most dangerous charlatans that ever walked in the name of Christianity, Todd Bentley, who claims revival, who claims to be a man of God, who has been disqualified from Christian service. It's been written about in Charisma magazines, Christianity Today, mainstream magazines, and some people, maybe even some of you, still watch his videos online. What about men like Gregory Boyd? The open theist. Do you listen or read, Boyd? Rob Bell and his love wins. The universalist. Kenneth Copeland. Creflo Dollar. Joyce Meyer. Jesse DePlantis. Benny Hinn. All of them charlatans of the health, wealth, prosperity gospel 
who blasphemed the Holy Spirit by claiming that they healed someone. Then they tell you that if you give to their ministry, you will be blessed 10 to 100 times forth. You ever notice if you send them a letter and say, if you give me a million dollars, your seed will increase tenfold, they will not give it to you. Because they're false teachers. They also teach that Jesus Christ suffered in hell and that the demons punished him for your atonement. They also teach that we are little gods. What about Stephen Furtick, the narcissistic Southern Baptist preacher of Elevation Church? Am I ruffling some feathers this morning? Because if you're listening to him, you might as well be listening to T.D. Jakes and all their pollution of modalism and narcissism. Jesus Christ did not come and die to give you a better life. He came so that you can be saved, and in order to be saved, you die. And that's what's happening. Still no ouch? Let's go deeper. What about Rick Warren? Come on. He just got removed from the Southern Baptist Convention after many, many years of ordaining women and boasting about his numbers, that he alone has called more pastors and trained more men than the Apostle Paul. How about Bill Johnson? Brian Houston? No, you don't listen to them? Well, before we pat ourselves on the back and say, I don't listen to them, why is it that we have no problem singing their music in our churches? And our pastors allow it to be sung. And then we tell you to go home. Listen to their music. Hey, while you're at it, why don't you listen to them preach? Songs written by homosexuals who are committing same-sex atrocities are writing the worship songs you're all singing in church. I'm singing. Well, I don't sing them, but you know what I'm getting. I just want to take it off you and go, Steve, why are you doing that? Do you see how deep it gets? You buy their CDs Hillsong United, mighty to save. You just gave to their money. You just furthered their ministry. You just told everybody you disciple, they're okay. And as I said, if it's not from men directly, it's from so-called revivals or outpourings of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 24, 24, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, even if possible, the elect. What's happening today? Men and women claim to have the five-fold ministry. You need money, I got it. You need a healing, come get it. You need a prophecy or vision for 35 bucks, I will tell you exactly what you need to hear. And the Christian church is believing that. But make no mistake, when the king of Israel wanted to go to war with Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat was wise and said, before I tune myself with you, I want to hear from God. And what did the king of Israel say? I have 400 prophets. 400 prophets who say victory and peace and good tidings. Jehoshaphat being smart goes, I have one man, Micaiah. I want to ask of him. One man against 400 Dear brothers and sisters, right now we have 400 false prophets. And when you hear that one voice that sounds right, the 400 are saying, false teacher. That is scary. 2 Peter 2.1, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. And what do they do? Who secretly introduce destructive heresies, denying the master. Oh, the overwhelming, blah, 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 reckless love of God. And you sing that. And all of a sudden you get this image of God. Some, forgive me, Lord, I got to be careful here. You get an image of, in your mind of some person who's just a whining, belligerent, useless, oh, it's so reckless, and somebody loved me. But the Bible says God's love is deliberate. It is intentional. It has been foreordained before the foundations of the earth even began that he predestined those who will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. He is, oh, it's not reckless. He came down from heaven. He didn't want heaven without us. Utilitarian. He doesn't need us. 
That is why his mercy and his grace is so amazing. Though he didn't have to save any of us, we get salvation at the greatest cost of the blood of his only begotten son. You can't earn it. Whoever believes faith will have everlasting life. Do you see why it is so, so dangerous? Verses two and three. Told you you're at a Baptist church. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard that is now coming and is already in the world. Like, seriously. Somebody said it a long time ago, I can't remember, but the initials of TBN should actually be called the Totally Blasphemous Network. So the early Gnostics that John was dealing with, the term wasn't coined yet, Gnostics, but they were early Gnostics. They were like the prototype of what would come later. But as we discussed in this sermon series, they were denying the very incarnation of Jesus Christ, that God is truly God and truly man. And so what John does is he brings it back to their attention here, and he's basically saying again, if you are denying that the Son of God came to this earth, if you're denying the God-man, the second person of the Trinity, Christ who was also flesh, you are antichrist. We get that, right? Isn't that really easy? Hey, is Jesus uh, God? No. Okay, you're antichrist. We get that. But what happens when they do profess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh? What do we do when people do hold to certain aspects of Christianity? This comes back to verse 1, why we need the test. Because people could become apostate. They're not fully heretical, but they start to move away. They start to drift to the side. So, again, we go right back to that testing of the faith. All falsehoods start with one drop, as I said. All lack of judgment. I shared this a while ago on a blog, and to some of you here, but there's an article that was floating around about a man who loved eating cherries. And when he was done with the cherry, he would roll the pit in his mouth and <coughs> crack the seed, and he would swallow it. Years later, he almost died. You know how he almost died? Cyanide poisoning. If you crack a cherry seed, it puts cyanide in your system. The first seed didn't kill him. The second seed didn't kill him. But often Christians, we're so focused on the biggest blasphemous thing, we forget that we could still die by death of a thousand cuts. It's the cherry seed of false teaching that we need to be aware of. Not necessarily TV, that can desensitize us, but it's the things in church. It's the thing that dulls our conscience. And again, back to the singing. This is why we have to be careful. For the David Crowder fans here, a simple line, sloppy wet kiss. Oh, how he loves us. What image does that put in your mind of God? What about forever, Carrie Joby? And we all love that one. It's probably in half of the Spotify list. Who holds to a lot of the teachings of the New Apostolic Reformation? Who holds on to the fact that Jesus did fight in the grave? What her reference is, it's that beating in hell that he took on our behalf. So when you're like singing that song, in death the grave he waved, or whatever the words are, that's what she's alluding to. And we blindly sing it. What about all these wonderful, fancy songs that most of us like on our Spotify that Jesus is my homie or Jesus is my boyfriend song? Make no mistake, you sing what you believe. And many Christians can't comprehend that our God is a thrice holy God and he deserves all praise, all adoration, all obedience. And when we only sing songs about us, no wonder Christians are the most selfish people on the face of the earth. Verse 4, you are from God, little children, and have overcome this, them, because greater is he in, the, in you than in the world. Friends, this is not a Pentecostal, I can do everything. You know, some guy's got a gun, I can. You know, you th throw off Philippians, I can do all things in Christ who strength. He says, greater in me is his in earth. It's not what it is. But this verse is our answer and our application. Because we start with our very first pronoun. If you look at verse 4, 5, and 6, there's three pronouns. You, they, we. This is the first one. God says that we are little children, and that is very important. That is why we can overcome. 
This is why we can have courage. You are from God, little children. You have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You know when the disciples walked with Christ? At first, it was here, this kind of relationship. But at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit indwelled them. Us. On your salvation, he who is in you is able to recall the scriptures, to help you understand the scriptures, to give you courage and bravery, and gives you the ability not to hide from the false teachers, but to confront them. John Calvin says, does a dog not bark when its master is attacked? And so many Christians stand by and let so many people blaspheme Jesus Christ, and we say nothing. Then we get to the second pronoun. They. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak as the world, and the world listens to them. A character of a false prophet or a false teacher is that they are worldly. This is why nobody cares about sound sound doctrine. This is why Andy Stanley has such a massive following. Because he's teaching exactly what the world wants to hear. And we as believers, specifically as elders, we are called to hold to sound doctrine and rebuke those who contradict it. But yet we have so much secular humanism in our churches. So much humanism. Some of you are going to leave here mad today that I did not give you a four-point breakdown of a sermon on how to better balance your checkbook so that you can honor Jesus Christ in your finances. Is that not true, though? The next week, we're going to talk about how to overcome the Antichrist. Tristan's going to get Antichrist t-shirts. You can wear them. I defeated Antichrist. You can get your armbands. We're going to put all our music, and we're going to make you feel good. That's what you want. That's what people want to hear. And all these false teachers, what is the one thing that they have? Crowds. Crowds. Thousands. Osteen has, what, 25,000 people? Luke 6, 26, woe to all men who speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. And I would give us a strong warning this morning, just because a preacher has a large following or influence, it does not mean they're preaching truth. It's actually quite the opposite. We know in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled and accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own eyes and will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths. That's probably why so many men sit under Joyce Meyer's preaching and learn how to be a man. How perverted. So many people think that they're worshiping Yahweh. Don't ever mistake this one truth. When Moses went up on the mount, and the Israelites said, fashion for us a golden calf so we can have a tangible visible worship. Don't forget those Israelites were actually sincerely worshiping. And they were sincerely wrong. Verse 6. We'll wrap it up. Third pronoun. We are from God. Who knows He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. And by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now, dear brothers and sisters, how, if you're like me, it is so frustrating and sometimes so deflating when you are pouring your heart out to an individual, either to disciple them or to evangelize to them, and they don't listen. You can walk away feeling like a failure. We, We hold on to doctrines of grace here, but you still feel that way. And we feel, why are they not listening? I'm pouring my life out here. Why are they not listening to me here? When we have to remember that the words that John are speaking are very, very true and found also in John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And when you have many of these people in these false movements who don't want to hear sound truth, it's often because either A, they want their ears tickled and B, they're not saved. You know, because in ancient times, do you know all the sheep were packed together in these herds, these big messy herds, and they would only listen to their master's call. There's a video on YouTube right now where they have all these sheep, and everybody's like, hey, here, sheepy, 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 here, nothing. 
The little shepherd walks over. This was in Israel. Sheep look up. They see him. They walk right over. Why do those sheep do that? Because they know in their shepherd is safety, security. They know they will be well fed. They are safe in Christ. So God's sheep listens. But you know what else is true? Goats. Goats. People who are not saved are not going to go to a church to hear about their sin. So they're going to follow their shepherd. That is the spirit of truth is the Holy Spirit and the spirit of error is the Antichrist. Genuine believers are those who testify to the reality of Jesus Christ. They talk about the role of what he has done. We profess loudly that he is our prophet, our priest, our king. He is Lord. He reigns now. You don't make him Lord. He is Lord. That is true. And those who do not make such a, a confessions often attack it. They attack the word of God. They denounce what Christ has done and our antichrist. So let's wrap it up. Let's get out of here. It's 10, 10 to 12. I hope by now you know the difference between right and wrong, black and white, true and false, because it's all about discernment. And I don't know half of you here this morning. I know some of you. But here's the reality. The Antichrist is going to come into your heart, into your minds, into your little life, and he's going to try to whisper in your ears that if you are trying to live a perfect life, if you're trying to be a Christian of the Bible, if you're trying to go to a sound doctrinal church, you are a legalist. And some of you have been tricked to believe the Hillsong Gospel, the Furtick Gospel, the Warren Gospel, the Meyer Gospel, all lowercase g's, all anathema, all false. There is only one hope for radically depraved human beings who live in open and opposite, just complete rebellion and treason to a holy God. There's only one cure. And that cure could never have been mustered up in some filthy creature such as ourselves. But because God in his sovereign election, because of his foreknowledge, because of his grace and mercy, he has rescued his own to spare them, to redeem them. He did that through the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lived that perfect life which you will never live. He willingly went upon that cross which you deserve. His blood was spilt because you were that wicked. We are so wicked, his blood was spilt. But because God is a God of grace and mercy, he will not leave you. There's a term called regeneration. That's when the Holy Spirit awakens you. You were once dead, you're now alive. You understand, you have faith. And so if you're here this morning or listening to this message, and you go, I'm not living right, I'm not following right, I've been trusting a false gospel, do not ignore that. Cry out to Christ. Cry out to Christ, save me. There's no magical prayer. It's, as I, we said, it's by faith alone in Christ alone. Just say, Lord, I repent, I'm sorry. Call out to him. If you don't know what to do, talk to Tony and I. We will stay here all night if we have to. But remember this. God keeps his children. He tells us what to look out for and he gives us the tools to stay safe. We will persevere. We will make it. We are called to surrender. Thank you.